Welcome to Deep Dive, everyone. I'm Margaret Lyman, Director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and this is the first in a series in which I'll be speaking to scientists from Scripps Oceanography to take a deep look at the interesting science that they're working on. And today, uh, our first deep dive will be speaking with David Sandwell, a professor of geophysics at Scripps Oceanography's Institute of geophysics and planetary physics. Dave maps the geologic structure of deep ocean basins using ships and satellites. And his research focuses on understanding the plate tectonics of, of the seafloor, especially uncharted areas of the remote ocean. He also studies the earthquake cycle, cycle on the San Andreas Fault System. Now, I mentioned that he uses satellites in his work. He has mapped the topography of the deep ocean floor using data collected by remote sensing instruments on Earth orbiting satellites. And he'll tell you a little bit about how he can do that. But he and a colleague at NOAA developed the most detailed picture to date of the global seafloor. And this really opened new areas for study because of the detail of the maps that showed structures that we didn't understand before or didn't even know were there. Dave has been recognized for his pioneering research with election as a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And he is also an elected member of the National Academy of Science. So I'm going to ask Dave to join me. Hi, Dave, and thanks for being here today. Well, thanks for that introduction, Margaret, and thanks for having me on this first deep dive segment. It sounds very interesting. The series I'm, will be great. I'm sure it will be. So we're in the midst of the American Geophysical Union fall meeting, and it seemed like a great time to discuss geophysics. So today we're going to discuss the state of seafloor mapping. And you've been a real leader in this area and have been working with a very ambitious effort called Seabed 2030. Can you tell us a little bit more about Seabed 2030? Yeah, Seabed 2030 is a global collaboration of scientists and their objective is to map the seafloor sea using multi-beam echo sounders on ships completely by 2030. And it's been organized and funded by the Nippon Foundation and JEBCO. Um, and our, our group at Scripps is providing sort of the base map for, the, for this Seabed 2030 based on low resolution data that we'll hear about. And, and then there are four groups around the globe that add high detailed uh, bathymetry. Oh, great. And, um, uh, as you know, I'm on the executive planning group of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, and Seabed 2030 uh, has been recognized as a signature program of the Ocean Decade, which will be from 2021 to 2030. So very exciting that Scripps is involved with this. Uh, so what are the current approaches to mapping the seafloor? How do we do that these days? Okay, there are two ways to map the seafloor. There's the tried and true approach, really the high resolution approach, and that involves ships, large research vessels like our ship, Sally Ride and Roger Ravel. And the ship drives around on the surface of the ocean and it sends out um, beams of, of acoustic energy. They reflect off the bottom and you can map a swath of seafloor about three times the ocean depth or maybe 12 kilometers wide. Um, and it gets you a resolution of about 200 to 400 meters, a couple of football fields sort of resolution. It's not great, but it's much better than what we have over most of the oceans. Um, and as I said before, so far only about 20% of the oceans have been mapped this way. So that's the main objective of the sea Seabed 2030. Um, but there's another way of mapping the oceans. This is something I've been doing for years with Walter Smith at NOAA and other people around the world. And we use these satellite altimeters. You can see the diagram here on the right. It's orbiting the Earth at about 800 kilometers altitude above the ocean. And it sends out these radar pulses, um, thousands of them every second. And they map the topography of the ocean surface, which 
seems sort of strange, but the topography of the ocean surface has these bumps and dips, um, and they reflect what's on the bottom. So if you have that big, a big volcano on the bottom, maybe a thousand meters tall, you know, a giant structure, it causes a bump in the sea surface, maybe 10 centimeters high. Um, unfortunately, these maps are at very low resolution. They're about 4,000 meters resolution. And the seabed 20 for 30 objective is 400 meters. So we're 10 times worse than their objective. But it's, it's a start and it's a way to help plan ship surveys. Um, if you know there's something big there, you'll know where to go. Um, I'm, I don't think we're gonna map 100% of the seafloor, but if we get all the big structures, that would be pretty exciting. So uh, is the satellite approach uh, the approach that would be pursued in order to achieve the goal of mapping the entire world ocean floor by 2030? Um, no, they really want to replace that low resolution satellite with real seafloor mapping data. And, and there's a number of ways to do this. Um, it's, again, it's very ambitious because we've only done 20%. We have to do another 80%. But the first thing they're trying to do, which is, is really good, is to go around to all the research labs and you know companies and people that map the seafloor and try to get them to open up their data and put it into a public archive so we can make the best available public data set. Um, and that, that's been quite successful so far. That's actually gotten us to the 20%. We were at like 15% before that. Um, and this also includes um, military data, which is a little trickier, but places like the US military have mapped large areas in the Northern Hemisphere during the Cold War, and it would be really wonderful to get these data uh, declassified and out there for this, this global e effort. Um, the other, there's a lot of other things you can do. You can, um, you can optimize the way people do transit. So, for example, on our ships, when we do a transit cruise from San Diego to Hawaii, to get to Hawaii, there's no scientists on board, we should, we should be deviating slightly from our previous ship tracks to map new areas of seafloor. And that needs to be coordinated a lot better. And I think this Seabed 2030 group is able to do that. They're, they're starting to do that. But of course, you have to know where all the gaps are. They call it mapping the gaps. And mm -hmm. um, we still don't know where the gaps are. And there's a, there's a couple other approaches. Um, we could, we could build new kinds of autonomous vehicles uh, that like barges that have lots of fuel th in them and, and map uh, seafloor. You need a big vehicle to map the deep ocean. But um, why don't I show you an example of one of these transit cruises that we did last year. Um, and Margaret, you started this. You, you sent me an email, an email to Bruce and me and um, Bruce Applegate, and it said um, the the people on the Falcor have found a seamount out in the deep ocean, and they want to name it after Walter Monk, and which would be a wonderful idea. But your email said, "Well, I thought we were doing this. Can can we do it a little better?" So um, Bruce and I scratched our heads and and looked at where our ships were going. And in particular, the Sally Ride was on a, right then was on a transit from um, Hawaii to Guam. And, um, and so we looked along that transit and found this seamount that is sort of blurry looking in the satellite altimetry and said, let's go and look at this and see if it's a geo. I'll explain what a geo is in a minute. But, um, and so we planned out the ship track. There were no scientists on board. I think Bruce planned the track and, um, and they went out and mapped it. And it took about an extra day of ship time, not, not a lot. And um, if we show the next slide, it shows um, what was mapped. So the previous slide was based on the blurry altimeter data. This is the real mapping data from Sally Ride. And um, it, you know, let me describe this feature. It's, it's pretty large. It's about 50 kilometers across and about 30 kilometers top to bottom, and about 4,000 meters tall, which is um, really big. It's 12,000 feet. This is a giant feature, unmapped. Uh, there are many of these things. Um, so that, that's bigger than Mount Everest. 
Uh, yeah, well, bigger than about the height of the Sierras. Most of the Sierras in California are about 12,000 feet. Um, but what's what's notable about this feature is that it has a flat top. And I don't know if you can see that. It's like the dark red. Oh, yeah. There's the flat top. And what, what the flat top is, that's at 1,400 meters depth. So that's pretty deep. Um, but that was once at sea level, just just 80 million years ago, geologic time, nothing. So um, 80 million years ago, that was at sea level. It was an island, probably a coral reef island. And it got eroded down flat. And then it sank um, over those 80 million years following the, the increasing seafloor depth with age. And, and we see it today. So it's a, sort of a special seamount. And um, Bruce in particular was wanted to get this thing called a geo because it's it's more important than um, a regular seamount. So we're happy to find this and propose the name for Walter Monk. Well, wow, that's great. I, I hope that it's approved. So uh, Dave, uh, is Scripps uh, walking the talk? Have we made our, uh, our various soundings and, uh, 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 and tracks available to the Seabed 2030 effort? That's a great question. We, of course, all of our data are open after 18 months, all out on the internet at NOAA. And, um, you know, we have a group here that makes it available, which is really, really good. But none of the oceanographic institutions plan their transits in a way to increase the, the mapping effort. They, you know, they want to get from point A to point B and save fuel. So they go straight along the Great Circle Path. Yet even a small deviation could provide lots of new data. So actually Bruce and I are thinking of a proposal to, to for at least our ships to add a, a day of ship time to each transit. And then um, we don't need to have scientists aboard. We could do this with a captain and the crew. We just need to give them the tool to be able to find these gaps. And um, I think they'd be happy to do that kind of thing. Well, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so I, I have a, a question for you. Um, I know that with your background in seafloor mapping, uh, you know who Bruce Hazen and Marie Tharp are. And yes. uh, could you tell our audience uh, a little bit about uh, uh, Marie and Bruce? Okay, well, I've never met them personally, but they were pioneers in mapping the seafloor. I should also mention Jacqueline Memorek. She was here at Scripps. And, um, and these, pioneers would take very rough tracks of, of the seafloor soundings, very sparse, and with a knowledge of plate tectonics, which was just coming to life then, they would um, draw in fracture zones where they thought the plates had fracture zones and put in depth versus age and create these maps that were based on almost no data, yet they were very realistic and um, wonderful maps hand-drawn contour maps. Uh, Jacqueline Memrix did the same thing. And um, yeah, that was that must have been a wonderful time to, you know, because you had plate tectonics being born and you had these these seafloor maps sort of uh, corroborating all that. So all yeah, that it, it's really funny. So as you know, my, my field is geological oceanography. And when I think about the ocean, you know, if somebody says ocean to me, what I see is the map of the seafloor. I see the basin. Uh, yeah. For most people, if you say ocean, they see the water. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, I see the bottom too. Yeah. And so for me, the, the ocean is the basin. And uh, when I was a graduate student, I, uh, I was going through, uh, I moved into a new lab. And in that lab, there was a big stack of the the big, uh, the big versions of the maps that uh, Marie Tharp and Bruce Hazen developed. And each one was, about, they were, I don't know if you remember them, the, the land was kind of a pale mustard color and the bottom yeah. was the turquoise. And each map was about five feet wide and maybe about six feet high. Yeah. And there was literally a giant, multiple copies of all of them. So I took a copy of each one and I wallpapered my kitchen. Nice. 
Very and nice. They hate them. Like <laughs> and then that was while I was a graduate student. And later on, uh, uh, the last few years that I was at University of Rhode Island, Marie Tharp was in uh, a uh, an assisted living home in uh, Rhode Island. And we brought her to the campus and she talked with uh, all of the students and the female faculty and just a delightful person. Really, really interesting. Wow. Yeah, and there's, wonderful. there's a wonderful book about her uh, her life and her, her work called Soundings, uh, really great. So why is it other than that you and I get off on the, the idea of the basin and that's what we yeah. see when we see the ocean, yeah. uh, why is it so important for us to have detailed maps? Yeah, I mean, from, from a scientific point of view, that's where I'm mainly coming from, plate tectonics. What you see on the bottom of the ocean is plate tectonics and we know lots about plate tectonics, but there are lots of details, secondary things that we don't know about, especially, you know, back in the 90s, there was a lot of mapping on the seafloor spreading ridges. It was the ridge program. I don't know if you remember that. And uh, they did a great job, but they didn't go off the ridges. So you couldn't see what happened in the geological past. You couldn't see all the seamounts being formed and the microplates and where the mantle plumes are. And so um, I'm excited about those things. But the physical oceanographers are actually pushing hard for this because, um, and this is something that Walter Monk really started. Um, when the tides, you know, Walter Monk was into tides and when the tides slosh back and forth across the bottom of the ocean and they hit a, a sharp feature like a seamount or a ridge, they produce these internal waves that, that propagate up into the ocean and they mix the ocean and he had some some um, nice papers called abyssal recipes. And, and the issue is that to, to be able to, to predict well, where all that mixing is gonna occur, you have to have really good maps of the bottom. So you have to have that for mixing, for currents. The currents will flow through these deep fracture zones across the ridge. You know, they might be 6,000 meters deep and the rest of the ridge is 2,000 meters. So they'll flow across this and so, um, there's all kinds of physical oceanography. The biologists, um, I, it's not my field, but I can imagine that the critters like to live at different depths and on seamounts and tops of seamounts and so on. So there's really lots of good um, sort of scientific region, reasons. And then of course, just the, you know, the um, general interest stories, you know, people wanna hear about Mars and the moon and, and the bottom of the ocean I look at is like, you know, it's just like Mars. It's just, it's so different from where we live. So, um, you know, kids growing up can, can learn about what I call another planet, planet ocean. So it's very exciting. Great. And um, I was just listening to a talk that John Orkut gave this morning at the uh, American Geophysical Union meeting that was about mapping in the past. And he also pointed out that uh, the lack of, of accurate maps resulted in one of our submarines actually running into a seamount at full speed. Yes. Yeah, I remember that. It was maybe in 2007. And we actually got some funding from ONR after that. So, um, you know, it's, it's amazing that I think the depth was about less than 100 meters because that's the sort of the depth the submarines go at and the water around there is like 4,000 meters deep. So this is a thing sticking up four or 5,000 meters unknown, you know, and then people woke up and said, wow, there's a lot more of those out there. And then the Navy started something called a red dots program where they went into the gravity maps and they said, look at this thing is big and this one's big and we'll put a red dot there and red dot over there and then go out and survey these things just to see if they're going to, be, uh, you know, collision uh, targets. So um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I'd, I ha I'll have to listen to his talk. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, it was, it was very nice. He has a wonderful uh, graphic where he shows the same area uh, off Kiribati and uh, how the, the view of that area improved with each new map that was made, not only from conventional uh, 
soundings, but also from satellite altimetry. Uh, oh, so yeah. Very the other, the other amazing thing about that collision site was you could see it in Landsat data from space. It was shallow enough where you could see the reef and no one had looked. So that was pretty astounding. And then people started looking. But that's unusual. It's, you can only see down about 40 meters. So, um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, well, I think, um, this is a wonderful conversation, and it, I think a lot of people sort of take it for granted that, oh, you know, we've been exploring the ocean for a long time, and we know where everything is. And yeah, no. <laughs> not the case. It's not no. the case. But your work is really important, and it is leading the way in applying all of these very interesting new tools like altimetry to the very old problem of charting the oceans. And uh, it's one of those places in our science where there's a direct line from what we're doing now back to the earliest times of yeah. seafaring. Uh, so you're part of that tradition. Well, thanks for having me on the show. And you know, Scripps is a wonderful place to work. And thanks for keeping it that way. You've done a great job during this um, coronavirus thing, keeping us all together and keeping the ships at sea. And um, I think we'll get through it. So yeah, thanks. I know we will. And thanks yeah. for your great science. And thanks for taking time to take this deep dive.